This episode of Positively Track is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Jim Stoffel, Joyce Marin, Carl Morris, and associate producer William Smith. Visit patreon.com slash positively track to help support the podcast. Perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, shout outs, associate producer credits, and more. Thank you for your support and keep trekking. But relations between the Klingon and Cardassian empires have never been anything but amicable. With the exception of the Betreka Nebula incident. A minor skirmish. It lasted 18 years. It was ages ago. Well, it's Friday, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of the Positively Trek Book Club, where we talk about a piece of Star Trek literature this time from the Lost Era. We're continuing our journey through that era. I'm Dan Gunther. With me, as always, is Bruce Gibson. Bruce, are you ready to talk about some Klingon Cardassian conflict? I am. I'm still hung up on you saying it's Friday because that's just great news to me right now. <laughs> <laughs> the unfortunate thing is we don't record this on a Friday, so I, I think I just got your hopes up and uh, that's actually kind of sad. I'm sorry about that. I'm actually happier now thinking it's Friday. Hey, it's Friday. <laughs> Uh, oh, I might have messed up the rest of your work week, though, so apologies to your employers. <laughs> I just won't show up tomorrow because it will be Saturday. Perfect. Okay, well, problem solved. All right. Well, yeah, like I said, we're talking about The Lost Era, and we're continuing on in that series. This episode, we are talking about the novel The Art of the Impossible by Keith R. A. DeCandido, and this one takes place in the years 2328 to 2346. So first of all, Bruce, have you read this novel before or is this your first time? Ooh, this was my first time reading this novel. I didn't read all the Lost Era novels when they came out. I don't know why I didn't read this. But yeah, this is the first time I've read this one and I've been wanting to. Nice. That's exciting because... I had a feeling in the back of my mind that maybe I'd started this one at some point and never got around to finishing it. Reading it, I'm absolutely certain I've never read this before. Like, I've never at least read it all the way through. So, uh, yeah, this is exciting. Really fun that this is our first time for both of us. Yeah, and you know, the thing about this novel is the cover. I just kind of want to talk on that because we see General Worf on the cover and we see a Cardassian to me that doesn't really come across as what this novel is about because I was going into this like wow this is a general wharf novel and he's a character in it but he's not the main character of this book yeah it's kind of one of those things where it's a little difficult for the cover designers to figure out exactly what to put on the cover because there are is no real like the characters that we have lots of photos of that we see all the time they're not really in this novel it's mostly centered around bit part characters that we've maybe had mentioned or seen a couple times throughout star trek history but there's no like picard or kirk or anybody like that really anchoring this novel so it's mostly little known characters that make it up so i i'm curious I would love to see if there were different versions of the cover and what those would look like, what they kind of went through to get this final version, maybe. I haven't looked, but, you know, every time we get a cover, there's always a different cover in Germany. Is there a German cover of this? I don't think this book has been done. Yeah, as far as I can tell, it looks as though they've not done the Lost Era novels. So uh, if they ever do this one, I would be curious to see what they come up with for a cover. Yeah, I don't see it in here either. So, yeah, I guess they haven't. So, uh, yeah, I'd be curious, too. I bet it wouldn't be just General Worf. <laughs> Probably not. Well, OK, so that opens the question, then. What would you use as the cover for this? Keeping it in the style of the previous Lost Era novels, which usually use photographs and that sort of thing. What would you do in, in General Worf's place? Well, it's like you said, there's some minor characters, so I would probably not even use a character. I'd probably put just a basic Klingon and Cardassian maybe fighting each other. Hmm. <laughs> Make it like action like, ooh, look at that Klingon and Cardassian beating up on each other. Interesting. Okay. Okay. I can kind of, now that I'm looking at this and kind of thinking, I, I, I feel like the idea of like, oh, there's a character in here that was played by Michael Dorn 
And we have some pretty good publicity photos of him from Star Trek VI. Because this shot of, at the time, Colonel Worf was not in the film. This is one of those promo shots. And I recognize it from a, like I had a wall calendar with images from Star Trek VI years and years ago. And this was one of the the pages. It's definitely like he's in a studio and they're taking pictures of him for promotional materials. So they're probably like, oh, we have this picture of this character who's actually in the book and it's Michael Dorn. So like people would be like, oh, that's, that's Worf, right? And maybe that would get a few people to pick up the book. It could, and I even thought you could put Worf on the cover because he is in this story. He's a little young, but actually you could put Alexander on and say it's Worf. Now that's funny because we're jumping way ahead there, but <laughs> I was totally picturing kind of an Alexander type when so Worf was, was in the book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How can you not? Exactly. Yeah. Well, we'll get to that later because that's kind of towards the end of the book. Uh, what I'm going to do now is give everyone a warning for spoilers. However, we're just going to get right into this. We're going to have spoilers pretty much off the bat. So uh, if you've not read the book and you don't want to be spoiled, you might want to go do that before you listen to this episode. But if you don't care, by all means, listen on. So I want to talk a little bit about where this story came from, and it really comes from just one piece of dialogue from the Deep Space Nine episode, The Way of the Warrior. I, I love that little bit of di dialogue where they're talking about, you know, the relations between the Cardassians and the Klingons have always been good. And Bashir brings up the Betreka Nebula incident and Garrick kind of dismisses it as a minor incident. And Bashir says that lasted 18 years and I love that just from that, this whole story was created. And in some ways, I envy Keith DeCandido for just, you know, having the freedom to come up with this whole story and say, okay, there's this 18 year incident between the Klingons and the Cardassians. What can I do here? What can I make it out of? And at the same time, I kind of like, oh man, what a, what a task that would be, right? To kind of try and see where I'd fit that in and, and how, you know, this thing could just be called a Betreka Nebula incident, but be this 18 year thing. Like, what does that look like? It makes me wonder when I hear stuff like this, where you take something from a small scene in a TV show, and then you expand on it in a whole novel. And this is so quick in an episode that it just makes me wonder, was Keith always holding in the back of his head like, hmm, I wonder what happened during that period. I, I would like to write about it someday. And then this opportunity came to do a novel and he's like, oh, this is the opportunity I can do with it. Or did he just start watching episodes looking for something? And then this is mentioned. He goes, oh, that's what I can play with. This would just go right by me in the episode. Well, it did. You know, I watched the episode and they mentioned it and I don't think twice about it. See, and stuff like that always jumps out to me when I'm watching something. I'm like, oh, I'd love to hear that story. I'd love to find out what that's all about. And uh, I, I'm wondering, yeah, is Keith kind of the same? Does he pick up on those things? I'm assuming because this book series was done, I think at the time Marco Palmieri was the editor. This was probably just an assignment. Like they probably had a bunch of different things that happen in this lost era and they said, okay, we've got this thing that happened here at some point. Who wants to do that story? This is all just a guess. I have no idea. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm wondering where the idea of the story came from and, and how that all started as well. Yeah, because I didn't even relate it to that scene until later in the book when he mentions that's where it came from. I was like, oh, okay, because I didn't remember it. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. So we're going to get into the story a little bit here. And I want to start out by kind of talking a little bit about the players and where we are in Star Trek history here. So we have the Cardassians. And this is kind of one of the first mentions timeline wise of the Cardassians. And they're kind of described a little bit in the story as an upstart new player on the galactic stage. So they're kind of newcomers to the the whole politics of the part of the galaxy that we find ourselves in. They're a resource poor empire, as we all know, and they see expansion as the only way to survive. And we kind of start out the book, they're surveying this planet, Rachnel 5, and they discover a source of Xenite, an important mineral that they need. And during the course of their investigation, they also find the wreckage of an early Klingon space voyage led by a legendary Klingon warrior named Chagran. So the Klingons are spying on them at the time. So they discover this at the same time the Cardassians do. 
and they both want to lay claim to this planet. And that's kind of the central conflict that kicks off this whole thing, basically leading to this whole 18-year Cold War between the Klingons and the Cardassians. So what did you think of this introduction of the Cardassians and kind of where they are in Star Trek history here? I liked it because we don't really see that much of the Cardassians prior to the next generation in Deep Space Nine. So there's a lot of information in here when they're talking about Bajor and, you know, it's just starting to, you know, how, where Bajor is and things. And it's still in the early days of the occupation that sort of thing. Cardassians are looking to expand. They're, you know, they're they're not at the top of their game right now, and, and they're dealing with a lot of strife and and things like that, not not having resources. What I'd like about how the book starts off is you're having a Klingon dad telling a story about this long lost sh- these ships that went out in this colony that's lost and and the boy's like yo i would one day want to grow up and find that someday and it's something that all klingons want so then when the cardassians find this long lost colony and this wreckage of this ship the klingons are observing them you know in hiding and notice the cardassians find it and it's like dang we're the ones who've been looking for this all this time and the freaking cardassians had to find it you know and now we got to get it and and all that so i like how this book started off because it was like that's the macguffin right it's that ship that's there and the Klingons and the Cardassians, the Cardassians don't want it. They just want the planet. They want the resources around it, but they don't want to just give up the land so the Klingons can have this stupid ship, in their opinion. Yeah, and, and that's awesome. That brings us to the Klingons, like you said. So they see this wreckage of this ship as having great spiritual significance. You know, the Klingons, they don't have gods anymore. They killed them all off according to to their religion, but their kind of divinity is based on great figures in history like Kalis. And in this case, Chagran, the people leading the Klingons out into space for the very first time, the story that it tells has, you know, deep significance to them. So they're very motivated to get this planet and get their hands on this wreckage. So it's kind of interesting. The story becomes a little bit about the competing philosophies of the Cardassians versus the Klingons and how they see things like competition and battle and ownership and that sort of thing. So it's it's a really interesting setup here. So what happens is they come to blows over this planet. They start shooting at each other, of course. And it's decided that the Federation will mediate this conflict between them. So, of course, who's an ambassador at this time who's very important? You might want to say Sarek, but no. We bring in Ambassador Curzon Dax, (laughs) who, of course, has close ties to the Klingons, right? Which... That was a lot of fun to be able to see Curzon Dax kind of in his element here and in his prime a little bit. I like how you're like, oh, it's not Sarek. It's Dax. It's like, yeah, but Sarek is in here. (laughs) Because Dax calls him to get some advice. (laughs) Which makes sense. I love that as well because Sarek was a mentor for Curzon Dax in his diplomatic core duties. So I, I did love that little bit of an appearance there by Sarek with Dax kind of not knowing where to go with these things and kind of doubting himself a little bit. So seeking some advice from his mentor, I think is terrific. I kept hearing Cisco saying old man, you know, (laughs) because when we see Jadzia Dax on deep space nine in that very first episode, I remember watching the premiere of that. And I thought it's so weird. He's calling this young woman, old man. And I kept trying to picture that Curzon Dax was this old man that was doing all these things that we then later learned in the series and, you know, his relationship with the Klingons and him being an ambassador. And we saw little bits of Curzon Dax and we've seen some other things with him in it, in the books and novels and, and comics and such. But I really enjoyed this because we got a lot of Curzon Dax. And if anybody should be on the front cover, it should be Curzon Dax, but that's not going to help, sa- help, help the sales. No, <laughs> <You know>? absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoyed his character because so many of the Klingons and the Cardassians, in a sense, and the Federation think highly of him. I and mean, he's almost like the Captain Picard of this novel, but in, in, a, in a crusty kind of way. In a crusty, <laughs> hard-drinking, womanizing kind of way, yeah. Right. <laughs> 
So one thing I loved about this novel, and we know, of course, that Keith DeCandido can write Klingons really well because we've read the Ikea Scorcon novels and various other examples of that. But I also really loved how he wrote the Cardassians. So our first introduction to them really is through Gull Monor, who's the cap, the gull of this ship that finds the planet. And I don't know about you, but his interactions between him and his first officer, Ekron, I loved those where he just would start rambling off about something. And, you know, the first officer's kind of used to it. So he's able to just kind of negotiate that and figure out how to tell the captain what he needs to know and get the information he needs. But meanwhile, Menor is, oh, these, you know, these people at central command, they don't know what they're doing. And, ah, uh, the obsidian order, man, what a bunch of idiots. Anyway, what was I doing? Oh yeah. This over, I just, I love that whole thing. Like these minor characters we've never met before. And Keith just like immediately makes me understand who they are, how they act. And I get invested in these really minor characters. Yeah. Cause he doesn't really come across as much of a real leader. You know, it just <laughs> seems like they just, took anybody to put in the order you know I, there was one thing though for some reason i think i'm so used to keith writing klingons that there were times where i was reading scenes with cardassians and in my mind i'm thinking klingons and i had, had, I had hmm. to keep telling myself no nope, we're on the cardassians you know i kept thinking klingons for some reason so i'm so used to that but that being said, it's how he makes these characters so interesting. They're not these one-dimensional characters. It's all the Klingons and the Cardassians. He gives them a lot of personality. And I think because he gives the Klingons so much personality in his other books, he was doing the same with the Cardassians. And that's why I kept reverting back to Klingons. I'm like, no, wait, wait, wait. we're on the Cardassians. These are not the Klingons. Yeah, it's really a brilliant thing that, many of the authors are able to do of the Star Trek novels because, and we've talked about this before, the Star Trek species are so monolithic on the television show for the most part. There are exceptions, but usually the Klingons are the boisterous warmongers. The Cardassians are the fascist nationalistic people, but these authors are so able to give them distinct personalities and really build out that culture in a way we don't see on television and that's both on the macro level with the the societies and the, how they work and on the micro level with the individuals, how they interact with each other and, and their personalities. I absolutely love that. Yeah. And I like how like Gull Menor would say, you know, refer to the Klingons as foreheads. You know, mm -hmm. it reminded me like on Enterprise, the, the Andorians saying pink skins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had that same thought i love that just that little detail i thought was great we also get to see you know members of the obsidian order and nabrin tain makes uh, a couple appearances in this the head of the obsidian order and uh spoiler alert father of garrick uh as well as a legate we've seen on deep space nine legate kel and entek another obsidian order operative that we see in the second season of deep space nine so i i, I do love that because we know that these characters have these histories and things that are going on at the time, Keith is able to bring them in and use them in ways that make sense for the story. Yes. And then there's times I thought, is he using them a little too much? Is he going to the oh, well really? too much? Only because it does feel like, and it, it didn't distract me too much from the book, but I kept thinking like, it, it seemed like, okay, what characters are alive during this period of time and I'm going to get them all in the book. That's mm -hmm. how it kind of was coming across to me because it makes the universe feel a little smaller that hmm. all these characters that we see, we all know from different things and they're all together in this novel. It was fun and I enjoyed it, but it also kind of worried me a little that is it making the galaxy feel a little too small that every character that seems to show up is a character we know. Hmm. Interesting. See, I kind of almost had the opposite feeling about it being that because this takes place at a time where there are no main characters whatsoever that he can draw on, that it makes sense that we get a little bit of a tie to the universe we know because he's pulling in these other characters that we can say, oh yeah, in that episode they mentioned they were there at this thing or that they were, uh, you know, in Starfleet intelligence, so they would be doing this at the time. So for me, the Cardassian and Klingon characters especially, I'm like, oh, these are all the little tiny bits of history that we've learned from them 
to get them weaved into this story in a way that makes sense. I really appreciated that. But maybe it's just the full list of characters. I can kind of see what you mean a little bit there. Yeah, and I'm not talking too much about the Cardassians and the Klingons as much as all the other characters in addition to that from the Federation and on and on. And again, it's not the something I didn't like. I really did enjoy it. I really liked this book. It was just, as I was reading it, I thought, eh, should he go there <laughs> as much? But it worked for me. So I guess the answer is yes, it's fine. But I did worry about that. Um, yeah, we haven't talked too much about the Starfleet characters. So um, the Starfleet ones that we get in this, we have Elias Vaughn from the Deep Space Nine relaunch. We have Ian Troy, father of Deanna Troy. Captain Hayden, who is Admiral Hayden, we see in season three of TNG. Uh, Captain Garrett of the Enterprise. Curzon Dax, of course, as we mentioned. And of course, Sergei and Helena Roshenko, Worf's adoptive parents. So I didn't mind their inclusion too much because they felt like they had stories during this time period that tied directly to what was going on in the novel, if that makes sense. Like none of them really felt forced to me into the story with the exception of maybe Hayden, like just like, Oh, here's yeah. somebody we've seen before throw him in there. But you know, everyone else had like a tie to the the main narrative of, as to what was going on at the time. Yeah. That what you just said is what I was going to say. They didn't feel forced. So that's mm. why I think it works. That's why I was a little worried when they were all like starting to show up. There are times like you're saying, Captain Hayden, you know, Yahora, we got her too, mm. you know, briefly. That's right. I forgot. <laughs> so, I mean, we're getting some of those in there, uh, little cameos, I guess. So, mm -hmm. but it, it worked. I liked it. Yeah. The Yahura thing, I will say a bit of a spoiler alert for future novels of the Lost Era. I think her inclusion here is setting up her novel in the Lost Era a little bit later. So that one, without that bit of knowledge, you're absolutely right. That feels weird. Like, why are we seeing Uhura here? Like, that's kind of random. But her dealings with Starfleet intelligence, I haven't read any of the later novels, but I know she's kind of a central figure in one of the ones coming up. That is correct. That one I have read. Oh, interesting. Okay. I'm excited for that. <laughs> Okay, so the conflict over this planet, we've got, like I said, Ambassador Dax and a bunch of Starfleet people coming in to negotiate, to help facilitate the negotiations between the Klingons and the Cardassians. But during these negotiations, we discover that the two powers have hidden fleets of ships nearby in bad faith. So they're not supposed to be doing that. They're supposed to be negotiating in good faith here. But we find out that they're very obviously planning to attack <laughs> both of them. So, so these negotiations fall apart very quickly. And it's Ambassador Dax who hits upon this idea, very similar to the Organian peace treaty between the Klingons and the Federation, where if there is a dispute over a planet, it was decided that whoever was most able to develop the resources and, and, and govern that planet the best would be able to claim it. So he introduces something similar between the Cardassians and the Klingons for this planet Rachnal 5. He very much comes from the Klingon mindset because Klingons revel in competition and proving themselves, proving themselves worthy. But he maybe may have underestimated the Cardassian response to it and not really understood how they view the world. So, and you put this as a question in the notes and I think it's a great question. Do you think it's a good idea? Do you think this initial idea is a sound one or was it not a good idea to begin with? I initially didn't think it was a good idea. I just thought, okay, this is kind of strange that we're going to mediate this conference between Cardassians and Klingons, and we're just going to say, hey, instead of choosing who gets the planet or trying to do something where, well, give the Klingons this one area where the ship is and Cardassians, you can have the rest. He's like, hey, you guys go to the northern part. You guys go to the southern part. The Klingons get the part that doesn't have the ship, and then you guys just you know, deal with the planet the best you can. And then the winner takes all. I was just kind of like, I just don't see that going smoothly. Like, especially with 
the Klingons. And I mean, I just thought they're going to f- end up fighting each other anyway. But I thought it was interesting with Dax that he knows so much about Klingons and he doesn't know as much about Cardassians. In a way, I felt that Dax was setting it up thinking that the Klingons would prevail and this would all work to the advantage of ha- having the Klingons have the planet. The Cardassians had a t- chance to do their mining and then leave with the minerals that they wanted. And then everyone lives happily ever after. But of course, it doesn't work that way. No, yeah, of course. Uh, there are definite snags along the way. But yeah, I had the same thought you did, that Dax kind of thought the Klingons would prevail. And you know, maybe wasn't necessarily rooting for the Klingons or setting it up for them to win, but thinking like, oh, this is something that they'll be good at. This competition will work out this way. And the Cardassians, I'm sure they'll, they'll compete as well and and be into this. But yeah, I think he really underestimates his knowledge of how Cardassian minds work and, and how this all works. So uh, this was another one. So we get Gul Manor now becomes the prefect of, of the Cardassian section of the planet. And the Klingon captain, Captain Kowlin, is my best guess about the pronunciation. He ends up being the governor of the Klingon half of the planet. And the story kind of follows them over the course of these 18 years that they're leading this planet and the various hurdles along the way. These small little stories that come out of this really illustrate to me the strength of Keith DeCandido's writing. There are certain sections of the novel where we get introduced to characters and we see something like that they're dealing with, something that they're going on in their life. And then by the end of this really short chapter, which is the only time we get to deal with the characters, I'm invested in them and I'm, I care about them. So an example is this Cardassian uh, worker on an orbital station who's like directing traffic around the planet. And there's this ship with this woman that he really wants to ask out, who's the captain. <laughs> and meanwhile, there's like this Klingon ship that's on a collision course with them. And like over the course of this really short chapter, I'm rooting for this guy. I really want him to ask this woman out and have you know, a happy life with her. And then like, there's this collision and she dies and I'm just feeling so bad for this guy. And I'm like, what? this is like a five page chapter. Like, how did I get so invested in these characters? I didn't know about five minutes ago. Well, yeah, there's a lot of characters in this book and it works because the characters are interesting, even if they have just a little to do or a lot to do. And you and I talked about this a few days ago while we were reading the book that it's a page turner because the chapters for the most part are pretty short. So you read a chapter and you go, Oh, let me go to the next one. And it just moves. So you have these good characterizations with these relationships and these little interesting stories going on and it's moving quick. It's moving, you know, through all those things very quickly. And I agree with you. I mean, I would get invested in that. And it's almost like these little short stories in a sense and this part of the book And we get these little character moments like that. And I really enjoyed it. And of course, when those two ships collide, you know, okay, well, this isn't going to go over well, which takes you to the next chapter, you know, because you want to see what happens. And the, the thing that, of course, happens is this gets more intense and more severe and this Cold War kind of escalates. And the tensions between the Klingons and the Cardassians just keep ratcheting up up until the point where each of the governments like expels all of the other people from their planet. And we see these little vignettes of these things happening. Like there's a Klingon restaurant owner on Cardassia who gets his restaurant, you know, shut down by the Cardassian military. There's a Cardassian mountain climber on Kronos who, you know, is just keeping to himself and wanting to climb a mountain. And he starts getting threats thrown at him and, He finds out that he's supposed to be kicked off the planet and stuff. And the sort of thing that unfortunately just keeps resonating for events in real life and that sort of thing, like it's not exactly the same, but my mind goes to things in the news lately about violence against Asians, for example, in the U S and even here in Canada as well, that it's really unfortunate to see these things happening. And that was kind of all in the back of my head as I was reading this, thinking how sadly familiar this still is. Yeah. I thought of that 
and among other things similar to that. Yes. And this novel came out, how long ago was it? I mean, it's still relevant today. I mean, it's been a long time. Yeah. So it was first published in 2003. So it's, so, uh, it's been almost 20 years. Yeah. So almost two decades ago. And how many times it's sad that we say this so mm. many times. You know, that we read a novel or a comic and say, oh, this is still relevant today. You wish you could say it's not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And at any point, if we'd read this novel at any point in the last 20 years, it would be relevant to something that's happening right now. And just this happens to be the latest example, which is just so disheartening. Yeah, because it's really showing how people are judged and not wanted based on what they are, you mm -hmm. know, and who they are. And I mean, this guy that's running a restaurant, this Klingon, I mean, people liked his food and everything, but you know, he doesn't always get accepted. My heart broke. Okay. So just that one moment where he says, oh, Gull so-and-so eats here. This is his favorite place. Talk to him. And the Cardassian soldier says, he's the one that cut the orders for this place to be shut down. And he's like, oh my God. And goes to attack yeah. the guy so that he can die with honor. And thankfully, I was so happy for him. Like, it's the tiniest thing. Again, this is a character I've just met this chapter. But I was so happy for him that he found out as he was dying that the gull that he served hadn't actually cut those orders. Like, the the guards were just taunting him. They said, like, ah, who's, who's that gull? I don't know. I just wanted to twist the knife a bit. I'm like, oh, you jerks. Yeah, because when they said the gull ordered it, I thought, oh, man. I thought, well, how do we know that's really true? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, see, I'm so gullible. I'm so gullible. Uh, I, I immediately <laughs> believed them. And I was like so heartbroken for the guy. And then, oh, I'm so glad he found out before he died that that wasn't true. Now, it, again, it's those little moments that really work. And it's not like there's tons of these throughout the book. It's not like you're reading this book of little short stories. It's just, you know, there's just a few chapters like this. And so we move to different time periods. You know, we start off in the book in, uh, it's like, what, the year 23. 28 and then we get to the second part part two of the book which is in 23 33 through 34 so it's only a year or two year period then we jump ahead to part three which is in 23 43 to 46 which is a three-year period mm -hmm. so we get these little moments in history we don't play out the whole 18 years in this book yeah, but throughout those 18 years, or throughout those three chunks of the 18 years, I guess I should say, Keith DeCandido shows just his deep understanding and knowledge of the Star Trek universe. I love the little tiny things that he includes as far as the characters that we know about, as far as their stories go. And it's stuff that, you know, I remember when I read it, I go, oh yeah, but I don't know if I'd have been writing this book if I'd have remembered to include it, but yeah. he obviously has this knowledge slash does a ton of research and makes sure to get everything in order and probably rewatches everything that kind of references anything here. But even something as small as the Klingon Kimpek, who is the chancellor of the Klingon empire for the first bit of TNG until Gowron comes to power. It's mentioned in the episode sins of the father that he had a huge crush on Kalest, who was uh, Worf's nursemaid. And that's included in this novel, where every time they're in the same room together, he's kind of going gaga-eyed over her and like saying, oh, hey, uh, how, how, how are you? Everything, I, I, I'm, you know, just stumbling over himself to try to impress her. To the point that the other Klingon that's with him is like, oh, that's he's doing a good job of distracting them from the questions by pretending to be so head over heels with, in love with her. Or is he actually? Huh. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. See, I can't remember all that kind of detail. I could not mm -hmm. write a book like this. I mean, I, I'm really curious. Is this really all this knowledge that these authors retained in their heads or to your point, are they just going back and rewatching and reading things and picking up on things and talking to the other authors? And maybe it is a mixture of all that. Yeah. All that detail. It's to your point. Yeah. I'm reading this and then picking up on things like, Oh yeah, there's that. And, that. and I'm sure I missed things because I don't remember everything that was mentioned in an episode. And I mean, how do they get all these, you know, it's just like they have to know this stuff inside and out. 
I'm almost sure it's a mixture of both. I'm sure they have a lot of this knowledge, but then probably going back and rewatching them again, there's probably just little things here and there. They're like, oh, I can include that. That's really cool. I, that's a great detail that I can just include in there for the hardcore fans to pick up a little bit on. And I really appreciate that stuff. I love that. I, I grin when I see that kind of thing in a novel. I think I could do this if I wrote a Brady Bunch novel because I have a pretty good knowledge of that. <laughs> yeah. I would love to actually like co-write a Star Trek novel with you. I think it would be, I think it would be a great amount of fun. Great. Well, you're the one who bring all the knowledge to it. <laughs> I'm happy to do that. <laughs> well, another thing that's happening, of course, during this time is the uh, Romulan Empire is in this huge long period of isolationism having cut themselves off basically from the rest of the galaxy after the Tomid incident, which we covered in the uh, novel Serpents Among the Ruins a few weeks ago. But they're kind of this specter that's looming over the last half of this novel because they're seeing everything that's going on between the Klingons and the Cardassians and the Federation as well. And they're always kind of looking to see how they can turn it to their advantage or there's, you know, a crazy praetor who wants to go out in a blaze of glory or whatever else, you know, the motives of the Romulans are kind of guessed at for a lot of this novel, but they're definitely in the background. They're kind of watching everything going on and seeing where they can kind of insinuate themselves. And it's one of those things that I, I always forget that the attack on Narendra three that we learn about in yesterday's enterprise where the enterprise C was lost and the attack on Kittimer were so close together. Like I never kind of link those two things, right? but they're very similar. And I, I never really linked that before. Yeah. As we were getting to those parts, I was like, Oh yeah. Like in yesterday, yesterday's enterprise, it makes sense that we're reaching this point. And then yeah, Kittimer, I was like, Oh yeah. The, yeah. And to your point, I never really stopped to think how close those incidences occurred to each other and they both involved the Romulans. So it makes sense that the Romulans bring the spice to the book. You know, we've got the Klingons and the Cardassians kind of going at each other, the Federation trying to come, you know, come in and keep the peace. But then the Romulans are sneaking there behind the scenes and taking advantage of these moments when the Klingons and the Cardassians are distracted and, and hurting one another and weakening each other. And this is the time for the Romulans to just start to make their appearances back into the galaxy. Yeah. And at one point on this planet, Rachnal five, there's a, a Klingon building that collapses. And of course, any accident that's been happening, the one government blames the other one and says, oh, it's it's Cardassian terrorism. The Cardassians say, oh, the Klingons are doing these things. But we find out in this case, it's the Romulans have caused this building to collapse and kill a whole bunch of Klingons. And of course, because they're blaming it on the Cardassians, they're kind of insinuating this little bit of chaos in there to to break up this thing <laughs> and you know again their their motives are interesting like sometimes it seems they're trying to like drive a wedge between the federation and the and the klingons and other times it seems they're just trying to like sow chaos yeah take advantage of that chaos wherever there's chaos there's opportunity i had a boss that used to tell me that all the time and that's so true. That sounds like a Ferengi. I, that should be a rule of acquisition. <laughs> oh my gosh. He could be a Ferengi now that I think about it. <laughs> was it. Wait, who died in that building collapse? I'm trying to remember. So that was, so Elias Vaughn and Ian Troy are investigating it after that's the collapse, right. but there's kind of yeah. like a secondary collapse that right. pins them both. And Ian Troy ends up dying, which is something I, I wanted to mention I was reading this novel and again, like I know Star Trek history backwards and forwards, but I get so invested in the story. I kind of start to forget things and get invested in the story as it is now. And I was like, oh my God, I forgot that Ian Troy dies like, and, and leaves Deanna fatherless at a young age. I totally forgot that like in the moment. Well, I did too. I mean, I wasn't thinking about it because we don't, I mean, I don't recall that we ever found out how he died. No, just that he died in Starfleet on a mission, yeah. Right, so when he's in this book, I'm just thinking, oh, there he is. That's cool, we get to see Deanna's father. 
this is great. I'm not expecting, oh, and this is going to be the story where he dies. I'm not even thinking about that. Yeah. And in a sense, I mean, we don't know about Chancellor or General Worf necessarily either, but he dies in this too. And mm-hmm. I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. And that's, again, I think a testament to Keith DeCandido's writing here because, yeah, I, I forget that this is happening because I'm so invested in the story as it's happening right now. So that's heartbreaking. I'm not, that's not even entering my mind when he's talking to Deanna over subspace saying like, Oh, I'm going to bring you a surprise. I'll bring you a present and I'll see you soon. You know, if, if my radar had been turned on to full and I'd, I'd been thinking, I'd be like, okay, warning bells. This is, this is that scene where, you know, he's not going to come back, but I totally wasn't even thinking that at all. And what about Luaxana Troy? Cause they're newly married. I had a hard time picturing her being this young woman. See, I didn't have too much trouble with that because we've seen Majel Barrett young. So I was like, oh, like Christine Chapel, but but Luxana ish, I guess. Yeah, I went there too. I did. I mean, it was like I, I did that too, but it was she just is so like flamboyant, this older woman that I'm so used to that I was having a hard time picturing her looking like Christine Chapel or number one and acting that way. <laughs> like it was just kind of weird. Yeah, anytime there's dialogue with her, I was kind of reverting back to the Luxana we know, right? Just right. because she's got that such distinctive voice. So Yeah, I do get that for sure. So with this whole Romulan aggression, we get, of course, the story of not just Narendra 3, like I said, but Kittimer as well, which, as any Star Trek fan knows, is huge in the history of Worf's family. This was how his parents died and how he came to be in the custody of the Roshenkos. I didn't realize in this book, I should have looked at the years and figured it out, that we would get that whole story in here, which I was really surprised by but really appreciated that we get the full telling of what happened there yeah going into this book i wasn't expecting that scene but once we were going to kittimer i'm like oh my gosh we're going there (laughs) you know i knew it was coming i knew it, but i wanted to see how it played out i wanted to see how it happened and you know that telling that story independently on its own would be one thing But having it work in this book as to why those things were happening as they did and the build up to that just makes it all that more special, you know, because Mm. we know why the Romulans are doing this. We know why the Klingons are there. We know, you know, all these things that build up over this 18 year period. It really works for me. And I wasn't like real emotional about it the death of his parents, I guess, because I knew it was coming and it was pretty quick and they died honorably. So that's a good thing. I also liked how Rosenko's, I like how he came across to take care of young Worf. And then when he talked to his wife, she's just, he's like, well, you know, we wanted another child. She's like, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. And she just kind of goes with it. And I'm thinking she doesn't really seem that thrilled about doing it, but we know that she's very, proud of her boy as and she falls in love with him over time oh see yeah i loved that little bit of dialogue because the moment she changes her mind i I absolutely love that where you know he brings it up to her and she's she's kind of ambivalent like i that's not what i had in mind i didn't know and then sergey says he's all alone he has no one we're going to be all he has in the entire universe and she's like on board and yep. I love that. Just like such a big heart, like yep. the both of them. Yeah. And that, yeah, that's where it turns. And, you know, as soon as he, we don't see him meet her, but you know that when they got together, all hope was lost. Love forever. You know, there's no way they're going to ever part. And this is a part of the story. Like, like you said, I wasn't overly emotional about it or anything like that, but you know, you have a bit of that dramatic irony where you as the reader know that something is coming, but the characters in the story don't. So, for example, before they go to Kittimer and Lorg, the family friend who's a part of Imperial Intelligence, says, you know, leave your children, don't don't take them. And they say, no, we're going to we're obviously going to take our children. We can't be separated from them. And he does eventually convince them to leave behind their youngest, Kern, because he's an infant and can't fight and that sort of thing. So 
you know this is coming and it's a little bit heartbreaking. Like I said, I wasn't getting emotional, but at the same time, you know, characters you care about, you don't want them to get hurt. I'm like, oh, I really wish you could just like change history and they don't go. But, you know, they do go and Worf ends up being orphaned and, and all of this. But that whole section, I really enjoyed watching or see it feels like a television show like it feels like i'm watching this as i'm reading but yeah. i really enjoyed reading it especially Worf's mother Kaysen finding out that gerard father of duras is the traitor before you know they both die i was like yeah i'm so glad that she found that out i don't know why i'm so invested in characters finding out things right before they die but I was really happy about that. <laughs> yeah. So this book will make you very happy. <laughs> yeah. Sure. There's a lot of people dying, but they get satisfying conclusions to their story a little bit, if that makes sense. It does. And, you know, one quick side thing from all this that I just want to mention real quick. I love the relationship between Vaughn and Dax throughout this novel. Yes. <laughs> There's such a great pairing. They're constantly picking on each other. You know, but there's like love and respect there too. Yeah. I, I love that. My favorite part, I think it was on, maybe it was on Risa, but maybe it was later where Vaughn says something like, whatever you say, ambassador. And Dax is like, how do you do that? Do what? Well, you say the syllables that make ambassador, but it comes out sounding like jackass. <laughs> and he's like, eh, it's just a, just a skill, I guess. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> yeah, that was classic. Love that too. I kept thinking about the relationships between characters as we go through this book, but not just these characters, but going on forward. We know that Ambassador Dax knew General Worf and all of this stuff. And so a later host of the Dax Symbiont is going to marry the grandson of that person that he met there. Oh my gosh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I was like... <laughs> I, I want to see from Jadzia's perspective now. She could tell Worf stories about his grandfather, which, you know, like that sounds weird. But at the same time, I'm like, that's really cool. Like, that's really interesting that she was there. She slash he was there for those important parts of history and bringing that forward through to that character in Deep Space Nine. Like I was I was remembering, like, for example, in Trials and Tribulations, where she said, you know, I'm so excited to be here. I lived through this, through this time and blah, blah, blah. And I really got a sense of that in this novel that I'm like, that's really cool. Yeah, no, for sure. I definitely was picking up on that too. But we never saw Curzon Dax meet Little Wharf in this, right? I don't think there was ever, because now that would make, I don't think they ever were in the same scene together, which is good because <laughs> I would have a hard time now picturing Dax marrying Wharf going, I remember when you were a little boy. <laughs> yeah, that would be a little weird. <laughs> but yeah, I don't think they do come across each other. I think they're pretty separated by that part of the story there. But yeah. Good job, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to, I'd be curious as to, like I said, the relationships between the characters, keeping that straight while writing this and making sure that you don't have two characters together that shouldn't be together based on later stuff in Star Trek. Like there's so many different stories being woven together here. That would, that would be the most difficult part I would think in putting together this story. It would have been cool though, if we had little Worf and little Deanna meet, but they hmm. don't remember when they are older that they even met as young children. Yeah. See now to further your point earlier, when you're talking about small universe stuff, that would make it, seem a little <laughs> bit too small to me, stuff right. like that. But the thing about this story and the way it's crafted is, you know, there are a lot of characters in here from the Star Trek universe, but at the same time, there's not a ton of like cross pollinating of their stories. Like there's not a lot of really weird meetups that you'd be like, Oh, I never thought that character met with that character before. That's really weird. You know, there's a little bit of that, but the stories are separate enough that it's like, this was happening here, this was happening way over here, and this happened over here just kind of around the same time kind of thing, if that makes sense. It does, and I like that, uh, yeah, you're right. It's not like all the characters are meeting up and all in scenes together. That's what I'm saying earlier. It's like it it works. It, it could have gone too far, and like you said, it, nothing was forced. It seemed natural 
Mm -hmm. but I was worried. I was like, all these characters come from something. Is it going to make the universe feel small? But it didn't. But I even like using from the lit verse, for example, like Vanguard, like to Prin. Right. Uh, She has an appearance in here. So it's not even just the series that is worked into this. And of course, Vaughn is a lit character too. I'm thinking to your point early in the novel, I think I'm remembering now that I was a little worried about that as well. And it was specifically aboard the USS Carthage where we had Vaughn, Ian Troy and Captain Garrett or Commander Garrett at the time together. And I remember thinking at that point, like, oh, this could be bad if the whole novel is like this. But Dan, that's the moment. Yeah, that's the moment I was worried on the ship when all they were and Dax is like, okay, Dax, Troy, Vaughn, Garrett. Okay, what the heck? (laughs) That makes sense. And I'd kind of forgotten that. But I think early on when I was reading it, I had that same thought there as well. But yeah, it's one of those things where there's no reason they can't all be together. But yeah, if they were if it was like this crack team of Star Trek people from people's past, (laughs) you know, and they all all of their descendants ended up on the enterprise in, in next generation or something like that. Like that wouldn't, wouldn't have made sense, but thankfully yeah, it doesn't do that too much. They briefly cross paths sometimes, but it's not like they all team up and it's all of them on this big adventure together. I'm trying to remember now, actually, and this just popped into my head. Is it mentioned in it, Elias Vaughn is in the battle of beta Z, right? Yes. So is it mentioned, it might even be in that novel, does he mention that he knew Deanna's father? I feel like that might have been mentioned there. It makes sense because that was written in 2002. So I could see this being in this novel, which is from 2003. I could see Keith DeCandido like using that. So again, this is just this author who has this knowledge or does his like ridiculous research and It's like, oh, he said that he knew him in that novel, so I'm going to use that. I'm going to work that into my novel. I I love this book even more now. (laughs) Exactly. How do they remember all of these things, you know? (laughs) Oh, it blows my mind. But I love how this book ends. Yeah, absolutely. So, which brings me to kind of the last thing I wanted to talk about, which is, again, this, this whole book is about the Cardassians versus the Klingons. And the whole thing over Rachnel 5 is the reason for this book. So the way that conflict ends up going and ends up being resolved, I think, is really interesting in respect to how the rest of the novel has led us to this point. So, yeah, because we have Chagran is that that's that you know mcguffin thing that we've got going here and what is it carvok what's his name the chancellor yeah carvok carvok he's the one who's really been obsessed with chagran and he gets killed and the thing about it is that he was trying to protect the reason he was obsessed with chagran is because he has an ancestor who was part of that original mission that was part of that ship was, I think the first officer on the Mm -hmm. ship. But what I don't think he knew that uh, Dax and Vaughn later find out, especially Dax, I think it was, was that these ships, this colony, what happened was that his ancestor helped prevent those ships from coming back to attack on Kronos to try to take over the government. So he was a hero. But I think he was protecting the fact that he thought his ancestor had done something wrong and didn't want to be embarrassed. It was really interesting how it made it look like, yeah, because he had led a mutiny against his captain. Right. And that looked very dishonorable. But apparently the original mission, like you said, was to actually bomb Kronos and take out the first city. And the first officer had prevented that. So there's this weird twists and turns that like... Oh man, he was a traitor. He was a horrible. Per- Wait, no, he was a hero. Wait, what is going on here? <laughs> right. I love that. That was really interesting, and the whole way the 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 conflict is settled as well. I think was funny in a way because Kim Peck is now the chancellor. He defeated Kravok in honorable combat, and and Kravok died without knowing the truth about his ancestor. Yeah, exactly. See, but you were saying before, you like how everybody dies and finds the truth out before they die. In this case, that didn't happen. 
Yeah, I'm I'm really curious. I'd I'd love to hear like a debriefing from Kravok after his death. What did you know, sir? And and when did you know it? You know, like I'd be curious about that. <laughs> but Kimpek basically says, okay, this is ridiculous. We've wasted too many resources. We cede the planet to Cardassia and let's just negotiate for these ship remains. And Cardassia is like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, right. Which oh is my the God, beginning. you people. <laughs> That's what Dax should have got them to do to begin with. <laughs> exactly. Which was kind of what those initial negotiations were supposed to be about, but they also were just too warmongering and wanting to shoot at each other as well. So yeah, like if, if there was only some way they could have continued those original negotiations without having to give this ultimatum kind of thing, it, it's just ridiculous that 18 years of this cold war and it kind of gets wrapped up like that, which story wise, I, I was going to say that some people might find it unsatisfying, but I certainly don't like I, 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 it felt very real to me. Like this felt like how this might play out in the real world. You know, you get so like single-mindedly obsessed about something that it doesn't let you see the bigger picture and the more easy solution to it. And this just felt like real world politics at this point. You mean things in the real world don't play out exactly the way they should? They're not logical? Exactly. I mean, it, it's a shock. I know. I know. <laughs> Plus, you had to do this to fill up the 18 years of story, right? You could just resolve it at the beginning. Speaking of those 18 years, I love the perspective of the two that originally started out, the characters we started out with, right? Gulmanor and Captain Cowlin, who are now in charge of these parts of the, the colony. And we see the final day of the Klingons turning over the planet to the Cardassians. And Kowlin is like this wrecked shell of a man. He's drunk himself half to death because he just does not want to be there, did not want to be there and all this stuff. And Gulmanor is still his like usual rambly self. And Kowlin has this bottle of blood wine that he was going to use to celebrate when the Klingons won the world. And they didn't. So he sends it to Gulmanor and it, you know, it actually feels like this final honorable act by this Klingon. And I, I love that. And Gulmanor is like, incinerate it, get rid of it. I don't want any more Klingon <laughs> yep. filth on this whole planet. I'm not drinking that. <laughs> <laughs> oh Yeah. I know. It was kind of sad. I was kind of hoping he would, but he was like, I wouldn't drink that. Even if it's their finest bottle of blood wine, I'm not doing it. You know? Mm-hmm. And like that to me just illustrated the deep difference between the Klingons and the Cardassians. Like Captain Cowlin is like able to swallow his pride somewhat and be honorable in that last moment. But Gulmanor, the Cardassians are a little bit pragmatic. They just like, there's, there's no like victory of, of like this fight to like regain this world. There's, there's none of that like pride in that. It's just like, yeah, we won the world. We got it get all the Klingon filth out of here and let's get to work doing what we need to do. You know, there's that single minded kind of nationalism that like, we're the most important people in the galaxy. Everyone else is just vermin. They achieved their goal of getting what they needed to get and to heck with anyone else's feelings. There's no like honor here. There's no sense of like accomplishment or pride. It's just, we've accomplished what we needed to do and that's it. And that's how it ends with the epilogue, because Mm -hmm. as like with the beginning of this novel, you hear a Klingon father telling a story to his children about Chagran and how important it is to them and their honor and such and tradition and so on and so forth. And now we see a parallel to this at the end in the epilogue with the Cardassians and a Cardassians telling a story to his children and his telling his daughter about, you know, how important Cardassians are and how we have to protect ourselves from others and their importance in the galaxy to the point that, you know, she wants to grow up and protect Cardassia. And it's, when you read that chapter, it sounds so sweet. Like, oh, you know, they're, you know, he's, he's showing her that, you know, they are important and, you know, in order to survive in this galaxy, you have to prevent others from taking over. And and taking control of that. And it just seems like to her to be such a natural thing. We're seeing how the generations just continue to build 
on their philosophies and it keeps going on and on and on. Yeah. And that it's like a splash of cold water when the grandpa is like, and the galaxy's filled with all these vermin, like the humans and the Klingons and the Trill and the Vulcans and the Romulans, but you know, we'll emerge victorious because that is what we need to do to survive. And she's like, Oh, I'm going to be a gull in the military and help, Cardassia eradicate all its enemies and they're like no nah, good for you you're such a good kid yeah so special oh. I hope that works for her <laughs> <laughs> but you know I kept thinking like well wait who, who does she grow up to be do we know you know and I couldn't <laughs> think of anything I was like is this a hint that I'm not getting am I missing something <laughs> <laughs> well that's a good point too because the Klingon bit at the start as well the uh the child is unnamed as to who this character is. And there's a few people throughout the book that I'm like, mm -hmm. Oh, it's definitely this person. Oh no, wait, it could be this person. It could be this person. Like at first I thought for sure it was captain Cowlin, right? Cause he's talking to the Imperial intelligence guy and he's like, ever since I was a boy, I've heard stories of Chagran and I really want to, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then like a couple other characters kind of say the same thing, yeah. including the chancellor Kravok, who I'm like, wait, was that, chancellor Kravok maybe so I, I love that he just like represents the youth of Kronos like he's just a Klingon kid and it could be one of millions you know this is just something that is such a shared heritage it was really I, I love that that it's not explicitly spelled out yeah, I know. I kept thinking the same thing, too, when a character would say, oh, I often dreamed since I was a kid. I went, oh, that's who the kid was. And then somebody else says something similar. Oh, wait, maybe that's who the kid was. <laughs> I'm like, I don't think we know who the kid is, to your point. I thought it was pretty clever. Well, with regards to this book, I guess uh, all that's left is to talk final thoughts and maybe a rating for The Art of the Impossible. I would have to say that I was very surprised by this book. I enjoyed this more than I thought I would. And I only say that, and I've said this before now that I think about it, when I read these books that Keith writes about Klingons, I always go into them like, well, I'm not that big into Klingons to read a Klingon-centric book, but okay. And I always leave them really enjoying it. So maybe because I go in with my expectations kind of low and then I realize how good it is, they come out really high. <laughs> and this isn't just a Klingon book, to your point. You know, we were talking about Cardassians and, of course, the Federation and the Romulans. And just seeing how all that played out and all the little bits of breadcrumbs from different series and novels and such that's woven into this. And it really is like a quilt. You know, he's taken different patterns, different sections, uh, you know, scraps of information and w woven them all together to create this quilt. So I say that I will give this book five out of five floors of a building that fell on top of me. Whoa, <laughs> it, it affected you that much. I love it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I, I have very similar thoughts. I just, this is one that for whatever reason, I've never gotten around to reading and I've always heard really good things about it. So kind of counter to what you said, I went in with my expectations really high. The thing is though, Keith DeCandido met those expectations and exceeded them, which, you know, is a hard thing to do sometimes when you have an idea in your head of like how good a story is. I really, really enjoyed this. And there's so much in this book. We didn't even get to talk about a lot of it, but there's, there's just so much in here that ties into so many different parts of Star Trek history. The like Star Trek history canon nerd in me is so satisfied by this book and then the other part of Star Trek that I really love that doesn't get enough love, I think, in the shows is the politics of Star Trek. So this book is just hitting every single button for what I love. And I just really, really dug this novel. So I think I'm going to have to give it five really good meals at Kurgo's restaurant on Cardassia. And I just like the best Pipius Claw and Breguet Lung you've ever had in your life. Ooh, yummy, yummy. Yeah, <laughs> I, I do have to call out our friend Justin Ozer, though, because right before I started reading this book, he did say that this was really good. And I, I so I kind of went and going, well, maybe I'm going to like this more than I think. <laughs> <laughs>
And he was right. Definitely. Absolutely correct. Well, Bruce, when you're not getting five floors of a really good book hitting you over the head, where can we find you online? I don't know. I don't know where I am. I have amnesia from the fall. I... <laughs> I'm on Twitter at Admiral underscore Rex, on Instagram at Admiral Rex, occasionally on the Star Wars Report podcast, and been occasionally on Literary Treks. Awesome. You can find me on Twitter at Kurtrats, that's K-E-R-T-R-A-T-S. You can also find me on YouTube.com slash Kurtrats Productions, and of course, in the Positively Trek discussion group on Facebook. Just search for Positively Trek discussion group and we will let you right in. We've also got a Goodreads group over on goodreads.com. Just search Positively Trek there. And uh, yeah, some really great discussions happening about the books. And you can see our bookshelves where we have what books are coming up in future episodes for you to look at and follow along. And email us, PositivelyTrek at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you so much to our Patreon supporters for your help in bringing these episodes to you. Really could not do it without you. We really do appreciate it. And thank you so much to our associate producer, William Smith. We will see you all in the next episode. So our next book club episode in two weeks, we are covering the Star Trek Discovery novel Wonderlands by Una McCormick and uh, we have her booked to be a guest as well so really looking forward to that but we'll see you in the meantime with a couple of flagship shows so until then as always stay positive positive.